My name is Ron Adams. Uh, the reason I'm talking to you is to share a little bit of my story of overcoming things. Uh, I was injured in the underground coal mines at 19, had my neck broken, could not raise my arms to feed myself at that time and was pretty much told about a month after my injury I'd never be any better. It was a horrible thing. I, I sort of revelled against the doctor saying that. So I always have fought to overcome and that's the story that that I'm wanting you to see today because you can't let other people dictate your life by putting ceilings or limits on you. And hope is a very important thing. And God is the most important thing because nobody, uh, I don't think there's too many atheists in the funeral homes because death's a long time if you have got nothing but that. But in any event, what I'm looking at is I've been in a wheelchair now for 40, hmm, 40 almost six years. And uh, the main thing that I want to try to convey to, to you guys watching is you can do so much more than you realize you can do. And uh, I'm not looking to have the most uh, difficult or most circumstances I had to overcome in history or anything, but I want to make sure that if you're watching this, that you can take encouragement and hopefully you can recognize the hurdles I've had to overcome. And that if I've been able to do those things, then maybe you can do them as well. Uh, I progressed through uh, after the injury. It took me a few months to get my life a little bit in order. But uh, I started going to college, even though I'd not really been college material, if you would. And a whole new thing occurred that uh, when you read the material, it's amazing how smart you can be versus not doing your homework. So I started doing uh, exceptionally well in school because I was focused and could not uh, go shoot hoops or whatever like I normally had done. And over the next, say, 10 years, I went through and got four degrees, including my MBA JJ from Northern Kentucky University and Chase Law School. And I started uh, my own law practice predominantly because nobody was really uh, offering me a job right out of law school because uh, usually you need to be a good golfer, run a lot of errands, things of that nature. And by virtue of the wheelchair and the limitations, you don't you don't make a good golfer in the beginning. So but anyway I knew that I would work hard and so I desired to to just keep pushing forward and in fact, the first year I typed uh, a thousand master documents one finger at a time because I didn't have any business yet. But over time, uh, 
my client base developed and now I have well over 9,000 client base and the main thing that has brought me success is, is not that I'm like the number one draft choice or the very best in anything, but I want to give you guys hope that we don't have to just be the very best or the very smartest or the most attractive. Uh, life is not really quite like TV. So if you can just hang in there, create you some goals and map out steps on how to achieve those goals. And like Zig Ziglar used to say, uh, long range goals help overcome short range frustration. And by having objectives that are day to day objectives, you can feel a sense of accomplishment each day that you're getting a little further to where you're wanting to be in your life. And that, my friends, is what hope is because every day we strive so that tomorrow will hopefully be a better day. And uh, so that's the most important thing to me is that you uh, can see that I've overcome and that if I did it and I wasn't the, the fastest, strongest, I know I'm the prettiest, but seriously though, but uh, I'm just a, maybe a little above average guy who pushed really hard through a lot of difficult things and have achieved a, a, a lot of good things. But most importantly is the relationship with God and knowing that my Savior is there because when you're really down and really on the canvas, so to speak, having the 10 count against you. Uh, if you don't have something like God, uh, you just, it's very tough to go on without knowing there's a higher being or a power for your life. So I've always had that. One, one thing is, when I was in high school, before I was injured, I was a pretty good basketball player. I started 81 varsity games in a row. And I had some scholarship offers. When I got out of high school uh, and I got my leg injured in college, preseason. So I got red shirted, came home, and that's uh, out the plan was to just work some that year, make a little money for pizza and dates and things that scholarships don't pay for, and then go back in the fall to school. But because I got the job in the coal mines, which uh, I worked 300 foot down and two miles into the mines. Uh, that job was a, not a fun job, not an easy job, but it paid exceptionally well. I think it paid about in 1975, about 10 times what minimum wage was. So 
I was doing very well, saving money, making money. And so my scholarship got messed up through a long story, but in any event, I couldn't go back to college, so I was struggling being in the mines going, I don't know that I want to do this the rest of my life. It's a very tough job, coal, dust, black lung, all the problems that come with it, plus the danger of roof falls in on people and being injured by equipment, which was what happened to me. I got jammed between 300 foot of earth and 18 tons of equipment, and it just drove my head into the roof until it broke my neck at C5-6. Uh, for anybody that knows anything about spinal cord injuries, that I am what's considered a complete injury, meaning that I, I have textbook limitations for the drawings on a nerve and motor skill test. But I always was blessed so that athletically I could do pretty well. And even with this injury, I've done so much better than was thought because not only was I going to have to be turned every two hours in bed the rest of my life at night and wasn't going to be able to feed myself or drive or any of that, I uh, overcame all that, got better uh, medical care at Craig Hospital in Denver, Colorado for spinal cord injuries. And so I was later able to finish sixth in the 100 meter dash in the United States for my level injury. Uh, which isn't bad for somebody that wasn't supposed to be able to move their arms. I uh, pushed a 10K marathon in downtown Louisville. And besides being crazy, that <laughs> that's a long way. Six, I think it's 6.2 miles. So pushing a manual chair 6.2 miles up and down the hills and that kind of thing. But uh, it seems like that each challenge that came it was sort of a, a personal intent on me to overcome, to do what I wasn't supposed to be able to do. Because I never would have dreamed that uh, that I would have gone to law school or be a lawyer or be a successful lawyer because uh, I was just too short focused on sports and I was active all the time. Then after the injury, that slowed me down. So uh, I started to use my brain in a much deeper way than I think I ever had before. And so I tell anybody watching, you can always do so much more than we realize. And I, I firmly believe that we take ourselves off the playing field of life way too often because we know our shortcomings and we know what we're not good at. We know the skeletons in our closets and the people that win are the ones who stay on the playing field. And it ain't just about winning, it's about uh, being the best you can be because God created us in his image to be our best. 
And it's my belief that we owe him our best back. And, and besides even that rationale, uh, I think it's in us to want to to improve and keep getting each day the hope of being better than you were the day before. That's why without hope, it's uh, very crushing. It'll crush the life right out of you if you don't think you can ever be any better. So I've been there and overcame that by sheer just putting one step to the next step. One of the things I always uh, have done is, is the Bible says that you have to let the days on trouble be sufficient. And so that's what it means. You can't look ahead and figure out every problem you're going to have in the future and try to fix it today, too. You only get the grace to handle the problems that you have in the day. And that's what Jesus said. And that's not to say surprise, but that's accurate because if you just chew today's trouble, you can manage it. Where you can't manage it is when you start adding tomorrow's troubles on top of today's, especially like when you're injured like I was and it doesn't seem like any day in the future is ever going to be any different than the previous day. You've got to set those little small baby goals to get you started. And then life is very much momentum. You, uh, if you have some success, it breeds success. And if you are afraid to get on the playing field because you might fail, then you'll talk yourself into sitting in the sidelines. And the fact, guys, is they don't pay the people in the stands. And the people in the stands pay for the people playing on the field. So I'd always encourage each of us to not be our own worst critic, to give us a little slack uh, of our own shortcomings so that who knows just what God might have in store for you if you don't automatically duck yourself out of the equation because of your own lack of confidence in yourself. Now I've had to overcome the spinal cord injury and that kind of thing, I still am a human being and I have all the same problems as everyone else has. Uh, like uh, in 1992, I lost my first sister to breast cancer and over the next 11 months, I lost my other two sisters to breast cancer. So within one calendar year, I lost all three sisters to breast cancer. And that was uh, an awful thing. And I can remember, remember, uh, my one sister who was about like my mom, uh, Dolores, she uh, always encouraged me to be the best I could be. And she was the first sister that passed away. 
I still recall the funeral and the song that Gary Moore sang that that Medler later covered, uh, uh, The Wind Beneath My Wings. Uh, that was the song, one of the songs that was played at her funeral. And I can just remember uh, sitting there and as the song says, it must have been cold there in my shadow to never have sunshine on my face. But you were content to let me shine. And that's what I had always done. And she had always just been right there and losing her and then the other two sisters. And one calendar year, your emotions and your hope and everything are just put to the test because doctors will tell you something and you get optimistic and then they'll tell you they missed something or or it's relapsed or whatever. So all three of those sisters were in different stages of relapsing or cancer reoccurring or chemo. And so all you did was just constantly for a year uh, keep feeling like your hope and was being crushed out because it didn't matter what happened, they kept dying. And fortunately, breast cancer is got a much better treatment record now and most uh, women I think survive breast cancer for quite a long time now but they did not so it was uh, a very uh, hard time for me hard time for my mother and uh, we all have to go through those things. So whether you're a spinal cord injured person or anyone else, we're going to have things heaped on us at times. And whether you love the Lord or you don't, it, scripturally it says the sun shines on the just and the unjust. So none of us are immune uh, I don't serve a great God that basically um, just hands out gifts to me every day, all day long. But that really wouldn't be, if that were really the case, it'd be nothing more than a vending machine God. And everybody would love God because they wanted to make sure they got their vending machine amount. So uh, we don't always understand, just like the sisters passing away, but God is in control. And without God, uh, what would we have when it comes time that you lose loved ones? That's uh, something we all have to face from time to time. And I'm, a, I'm here to say that there is eternal hope and hope again. It matters more than anything when you're talking about loved ones, losing them, because if they really, there was nothing more, they were just gone that would be enormously difficult there. When I was injured in 1977 on St. Patrick's Day of all days, uh, the world was not really very accessible and we had the Americans with Disability Act didn't go into place till like 
let's see, 15 years later, I think, when I finally got out of rehab, uh, the first rehab in Louisville, uh, there was nothing. When I, I went, I went to work one morning and got injured, got air cared to Louisville, and I didn't come home for five months. And when I came home, I'm in a chair with a lot of issues. And we, I grew up and we had a, a mobile home. And so we had to build ramps to get me in the mobile home had to tear doors out for me to get through the doors. Um, and then over the uh, coming months, I learned how to drive and that I had to face all the challenges of, there weren't really handicapped parking spots at that time. And if, if somebody put up a handicap parking spot, they just put a little symbol somewhere and called it a handicap spot, which for the first um, 30 years I was injured, I pushed in a manual chair. And every time I went somewhere driving, I folded up the chair and slid it behind my seat. And one of the big problems was when the parking places that were accessible were not wide enough in the early days. So if somebody parks and that door won't swing all the way open, you can't get your chair up there to even transfer into the car. So those days, and even today, we have so many people that have handicapped decals that it's still not great because there's just so many disabled individuals. But at least if you find a spot that's wide enough and, and functional, and then before all the ADA, uh, there was no guidance on ramps. So ramps were whatever anybody wanted to make them. And I remember going, trying to go into the Pizza Hut first time after I'd been home and it had a curb step up about like that and they just took asphalt and stuck right against it to make it a slope like that. But you can't push up slopes like that. So that was, it's like just everything was complicated. And I've learned even now that as long as you plan in advance something you want to do, you can plan out so you can avoid some of the problems you're going to run into because if you're trying to do something and you didn't plan it out, it can be very discouraging because you keep running into problems where you can't just enjoy whatever you're trying to do. But uh, over the years, those things have improved. I don't, I don't know how much improvement there truly has been in the workforce place for people with disabilities, but I know that you can succeed if you want to bad enough. Now, whether uh, you get a chance to get a job you might would have wanted and because of an injury, you can't, you're not going to be the best candidate. You could still succeed. And 
I remember once I once I started to go to college, my first school was a community college. When I went there to go to school the first semester, they didn't have accessible doors or didn't have power doors or they didn't have very accessible bathrooms. And all of that was like, uh, how am I ever gonna function with so many differing hurdles to overcome? And, and that was a reality for many years. But once I got out, uh, I, my first degree, associate's degree of arts. Then I went to Murray State University and, and finished my bachelor's degree in business management. Then I moved from Murray State in Murray, Kentucky all the way to Northern Kentucky to go to Chase and to get my MBA. And when I came up to this area, which is now still where I live, uh, Chase, or Northern Kentucky and Chase, uh, had the most accessible school because it was a n more recently built school. Like Murray State University is beautiful. It's got lots of old trees and things. But the grades and the slopes and everything are a little more difficult to navigate than a place that was built with the pretty much trying to be a, uh, available to people with disabilities and they they had that university even before the ADA so that was a, one of the reasons I chose to go go there but um, what else can I tell you um, I would tell you that uh, when I first started law school, uh, we had to do an introduction to law class after we had been accepted. And we did that the first week of school. And I told the professor that if possible, I'd like to dictate my answers because that's some of what I'd done in undergraduate. And the professor told me I wouldn't need to do that. It wouldn't take me 30 minutes to take the test. And I never forget that night he gave me the test. It was almost 30 pages long. So it's like, it's going to be hard to finish thoroughly going over it in 30 minutes, mine less trying to write or scribble or what have you. And again, I've already told you that I'm not the very best, the number one draft choice or something like that. So when I took that test, I knew that I'd done poorly and I had to push back to the dorm at, at that night. And there was, that was a serious gut check because nothing like what I was saying earlier, don't take yourself off the playing field. Well, when you feel inferior or inadequate, uh, it doesn't take long for Satan to convince you you don't belong. And and I just about did that that night because as I pushed back to my dorm, I was like, I could just hear all the in my head, 
this is too much for you, you're not prepared well enough, you're not smart enough, you're not, 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 whatever you want to fill in. And uh, I was seriously contemplating loading my vehicle and coming home that night, even though it's four and a half hour drive. But as I pushed back to my dorm, it took about 10 minutes. And so by the time, say seven or eight minutes had gone by, I started thinking, well, I, I might not be the smartest guy. I might not be the most talented guy, but I'm not above and I'm not quitting. So if, uh, if uh, it comes back, I did bad, I'll just do what I have to to keep going forward. So in that couple of three minutes of pushing back, that convinced me to stay and keep, keep pushing forward in school. Well, law school the first semester as is all law classes, you only take one exam at the end of the semester. And those were over 700 text pages per class per semester. And so <laughs> it's a pretty daunting thing when you're studying 700 pages and you don't even have a grade on the book. So this is your first uh, and only test. So if you miss the boat, you're dead. But it was uh, about two weeks for the final exams. It was late November. And then I got a note that I need to come see the dean. And the dean showed me my introduction to law test. And uh, I won't ever forget it because I don't know why, but teachers always have to write in red ink on that stuff. So I had a big mark in red ink I think it was 19 was my score. And I don't know if that was out of 100 or 50 or what. But I do remember in red ink, written incredibly poor, students should consider other career objectives. It's like, wow. So, I thought that might happen, and it has happened. But again, uh, and this is how God has always done things with me. Um, instead of giving up there in November, I got irritated because they had let me take all the way from August to late November to find out if I passed. So I worked my tail off all that time, studying, studying, studying 10, 11 hours every day. And uh, then I, I was just uh, pissed because they told me that two weeks before my first exam that really counts. So it's like, well, I don't know, but uh, I'm going to study hard. And I'm going to take these tests. And whether I don't make it or not, I'm not quitting. And so I took the first exams. <clears throat> and they didn't let me dictate, but and that helped my grades back some, but I had a 2.0 first semester. At Chase at that time, 
2.2 was the mean average. So that meant if you were below a two, you were on probation. And I got a 2.0 first semester, and I wasn't too happy with the C average until the class ranking came out, and I was 59 out of 103 with the 2.0. So I'm like, well, I may be incredibly poor, but I'm, I'm ahead of 50 something. I just uh, I want you guys to realize that the things I've gone through and, and continue to go through, uh, it's not insurmountable, it's not always fun, but I hope that it can encourage you that those days when they come and they always do, when you feel inadequate, overwhelmed, or just not good enough, uh, that you'll pull your bootstraps up and keep pushing because there's a fine line between success and failure. And basically, so many people, they don't really fail. They quit before they fail because of their own insecurities and doubts. And as long as you got hope and you got the promise, just like in Jeremiah 29, 11, where the scripture says, I know the plans for you, uh, at, for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. And that's God saying, I want you to have a future and I want you to have hope. And it took me a long time to get that in my head, but uh, the creator of the world said, you need a future, which means you need goals and you need hope, which means a measuring ability to see that you are a little better each day and that you're a little closer to what you're trying to achieve. And as long as you keep real focused, and not ahead, trying to live next month ahead, just right now you can, uh, achieve a lot of things that you'd surprise yourself.